Let's preview the Pacers season with a little bit of the fantasy basketball perspective in mind. Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball. I break down the Pacers' potential starting lineup, rotation, who could be a rising candidate, who could falter, and plenty more on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Thursday and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, crossover in August, very rare here at Locked On. That's what makes us the best with Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball, what he does every August a preview of every single team in the league from a fantasy perspective. So deeper dives onto minutes of players, development, rotational patterns, all sorts of stuff that could influence a player's uh, season, both from an actual basketball perspective, because that matters for their playing time, but also from a fantasy perspective. Josh just crushes it in this business. These previews are awesome. And he set all this up. So if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you'll get all the fancy graphics that he's able to use. And if you're listening, you'll hear him talk for the ads. So be prepared for that. But Josh is the best. You get a nice Aussie accent for the second time in a week here on Lockdown Pacers. Let's dive into this Pacers season preview with Josh Lloyd. Now we are here talking Pacers, uh, like I said. And I'm not sure if you're aware, mystery guests we've already announced, but the rearview mirror was invented in Indiana. So that's why I, I, I believe that you are now labeled an, a traitor to Indiana because I heard that you took all the rearview mirrors off your card because it's only it's only looking forward for Tony East. Only, for, no. only forward here well, in Indiana. I It's very scary driving, actually. Traffic is a bit of an alarming alarming thing. Maybe they need more rearview mirrors. Just put them all over the car just so everyone can pay attention to what's going on. Tony East, welcome to the show. We're here to talk about the forward-moving Indiana Pacers. Forget the Indiana invention, the rearview mirror. It is about looking forward. And this team, um, I said this in the intro before you came on, is that people expected them to take a step forward last season, but I would say that a bunch of people would look at what they did and go, yeah, maybe not that far. Like, I don't think that that is real or that is what we expected. Do you think that this conference finals experience, look like they're a conference finals level team, they made the conference finals, but I would say the general perception is that they aren't that team. Is that how you view it? Sort of. You know, I, I would have predicted them to beat the Bucks probably either way. They smoked the Bucks a lot during the regular season. Uh, they certainly had luck on their side and their postseason opponents specifically, and they were well-equipped to take advantage. That said, I do think people are a little low on the, the – or a little too luck-infused in that discussion. I mean, they had the best offense in the playoffs, like, by a lot. <laughs> Even when it was all said and done, they were the only team that scared the Celtics consistently, even though they got swept in that series. Like, they are going to be, again, one of the best offenses in the league. And, yeah, they've got to guard better. And if they don't, then maybe that will be looked at as a fluke. But they are they have Tyrese Halberton still last time I checked. Like, they're going to score, and they're going to be a tough out in the regular season every night because of that. And they have a lot of young guys who can take a step forward. I obviously understand that the top of the East got better. But I do think they are – uh, closer to that that people give them credit for, even though they're probably still like fourth or fifth in the East if you just had to rank the teams. I think part of maybe the skepticism is, yeah, these, the injuries that get that get blown up, but also the fact that when we look, and we're going to put this up now, is what this team did in the offseason, the answer is nothing. Like, there's hardly anything that happened. They drafted Johnny Furphy in the second round. There's Tristan Newton on Rick Freeman, who was in the second round too. They still haven't even signed. James Wiseman is really the only free agent signing on this team. So there's just not a lot that actually went on because most of their work was done um, last season. So when I ask all the hosts, you know, who the biggest addition is, obviously that's not an easy thing for someone like you to do when you're looking at, at that list. And yeah, the name you came up with is a big name. He was the second overall pick was James Wiseman. Now, the question here is, I there's no question. I think that he is bad and I think he's been bad his entire career. And I don't really think that he's going to ever become good. The question here about James Wiseman is, Tony, is that do you think he's actually going to be is someone who is challenging for minutes or is he just like emergency third string center and that backup spot is pretty clearly Isaiah Jackson's? Yeah, I think Isaiah Jackson's got the backup spot locked down. He had it locked down in the playoffs last year, even True. with Jalen Smith still on the team. And Jalen Smith got, you know, $27 million from Chicago this summer. Look, I, uh, the, the bet on Wiseman makes sense, right? They have earned the right to do this. 
because Obi Toppin and Aaron Neesmith and Tyrese Halliburton and everyone from the 2020 draft came to Indi- – Jalen Smith even – came to Indiana and got a lot better, right? So their player development program has been working recently. It's just different now that they're trying to win instead of develop talent. So if they can develop Wiseman, it'd be a home run, right? Like he's huge yeah. and fast, but no one else has done that yet. Golden State and Detroit have tried. So I, I get why they did it, even though I thought they would go for a more established big, but that is probably their – most impactful addition, at least in terms of what they've done in the offseason, because I don't know anything about the draft picks, but I don't I don't expect him to be in the rotation opening night, although center is the most commonly injured position. So he'll definitely play a time. And Carlisle often will, will rotate those backup center positions, but I, I do think that it is relatively clear that it is Isaiah Jackson in that spot, which yeah, people love Isaiah Jackson's fantasy potential. We've wanted this for a while, and yeah, it, it at least puts him a little bit closer to that if Turner does get hurt that we do expect a larger role from Jackson and then there's a real chance of sort of a breakout in terms of the other guys who were drafted like is there any word on what they're doing with uh, Enrique Freeman unless I've just missed it I haven't seen that he's actually been signed yet you're correct he hasn't I mean I I am a little bit reading between the lines but the fact that they signed their other two two-way guys on the same day Mm -hmm. leads me to believe that they liked his summer league so much that they're considering a roster spot for him or a two-way there's no way he would get nothing obviously they drafted him so if they knew for sure it was a two-way, they would have just done it when they did Newton and Quentin Jackson. So that's just a, 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 bit, a bit of a guess. They have Kendall Brown, and I guess Cole Swider. We'll see what that comes oh, in yeah. at uh, on non-guaranteed deals. So I, I would imagine that's the decision, but it'll I, I, I'm almost certain it will be a two-way or more for him. It's just what it'll actually be. In terms of the guys that left the team, um, again, not much changing there. Jalen Smith goes to Chicago. Doug McDermott goes to the Ether. He hasn't signed anywhere. Oscar Shibwe and Isaiah Wong were on the two ways. Um, last season, Wong was playing summer league for Phoenix, and Shibwe was playing uh, for Indiana, and he just sort of does the things that he does. He grabs rebounds, but no real spot for him uh, at the moment in the NBA. But that does bring us to talk about, again, we're going to focus on this backup center position because it is pretty important, I think, and they do lose... Um, Jalen Smith, who who had, or well, his role in Indiana was variable, starting power forward, backup center, third string center, backup power forward. He was all over the place. This, uh, in terms of, as the graphic just refuses to come up there, I don't know why that didn't come up, but that's okay. We'll figure that out in a second. No, that's what I wanted. I wanted this one. Oh, the, the perils of trying to sort it out yourself. Um, Jalen Smith is up on the screen now for those of you watching. Um, yeah, like... Is this a big loss or did Jackson do enough to just be like, you know, we we don't need you here? Or is it more of a case of Jalen Smith saying, I have got a bigger opportunity somewhere else and the Pacers saying, cool, you don't have that here, see you later. Yeah, the Pacers are currently uh, like $400,000 from the tax. And so I think finances had something to do with that. He got a raise to go to Chicago, but... I mean, last season, Jalen Smith at his best was awesome, right? Mm-hmm. Like he made he made every three in 15 games or something. He also missed every three in 14 games. I believe in half of his appearances, no or maybe one less than half, he either made or missed every single three he took. Right. That, so that that's a crazy season. stat. I know. I used that in our oh, wow. season recap. I did with Cooper on him. It's remarkable to look at. So some games he was like, you can't get this guy off the floor. And some games it was like, how quick can we get Turner back out there? So it was really inter- it's it's just really interesting that. For a long time, he had that spot held down, but I, I kind of wonder if that's a confidence thing. And in the mm-hmm. postseason, he had none. He just he only played more than ten minutes twice in the whole playoffs. And Isaiah Jackson played and was good yeah. in those games, especially in that Knicks series. So if that had not happened, where Isaiah Jackson was good, I think there would be like, oh, what are they going to do with the backup five? But I mean, that's almost like their 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 whole season's about the playoffs now, right? So proving that they have that kind of guy already on their team, I think, made it a lot easier for them to go well. We can't really afford you anyway. So I think a lot of factors were at play between his consistency, the emergence of Jackson, because they had too many bigs last year. They don't have any room to have Jalen Smith play the four, which is something they did at times before they acquired Siakam. So just a lot of snowballing factors that made it harder for them to have all the centers they had made it easier for them to, I think, let him walk because their center rotation is now pretty set. They've got three guys that that they like. Yeah, straightforward. And if you haven't got ga- gathered the undertone from this first segment of the show, it's that yeah, Isaiah Jackson seem, is pretty locked into a solid role. That might be 18 minutes. It might be 22 minutes. Carlisle can move those centers around. Like Miles Turner didn't play 30 minutes a night last season. So just we just keep an eye on where <laughs> well, Isaiah Jackson's uh, role is. And I would add, too, that they flexed a lot, even during the regular season at times, but mostly during the playoffs. If they need to, Obi Toppin plays the five sometimes, yep. right? So that 
they're ready for that opportunity should it be something they have to do also. Absolutely. We're going to be back to talk more paces in a sec. Today's episode is brought to you, though, by FanDuel Sportsbook because right now in the summer, as the summer does start to wind down, though, sports will start to ramp up, but it's been a barren wasteland. There's been the WNBA that's going on. The Olympics are at the moment. Major League Baseball's there, but everything else is dormant. But FanDuel knows they've got a little something for you. Every customer, not just these new blow-ins who come in as a new customer and get the bonus. Everyone. Every customer on FanDuel gets something every day through the summer. You get a bonus or a boost. That's how they roll. A bonus, a boost, every customer, every day, all summer long. Now, I assume that this promotion finishes on the exact end of summer, which you guys in America have different seasonal dates that we have, which always throws me off. Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't your don't your seasons end on like the 20th of a month or 21st? We bang we bang on the, the first. No, it's not random. It, it runs on the, the solstice dates. The like winter solstice, summer solstice, are like the twenty first. So that's that sort of that. We go, we just say, hey, bang, summer for us, December first, and we just run in three month, three month periods. But that doesn't matter because there's oh, what? Come on, it's all right. Anyway, so that's when your that's when your FanDuel offer ends at eight forty three a.m. on September twenty second. Get your daily boost and bonus. I'm sure I'll, I'll do a live read right at that time just to tell you that that uh, is ending over on FanDuel Sportsbook. So go to FanDuel.com. Right now, and make the most of your summer until 8.43 a.m. September the 22nd. Fan Jewel Sportsbook. Don't forget to gamble responsibly. Now, that was definitely a really good ad read. Fantastic for me. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next part, and we're going to talk about uh, projected starters. It isn't particularly controversial or confusing, I, I don't think, Tony. We're going to have Tyrese Halliburton in there. We're going to have... Pascal Siakam are going to have Miles Turner. I guess there could be some discussion about what happens at the other two spots, Andrew Nempard and Aaron Neesmith. But I would say that not many people are going to argue about Nempard. Got the um, contract extension, put up the big uh, numbers in the playoffs at times. I- I'm going to talk more about Nempard later, so I'll leave him here. I do want to just focus a little bit here on Aaron Neesmith, who didn't start all of last season, then did end up replacing Obi Toppin as the starting power forward. Was a really high foul player, but a really strong defender who doesn't put up huge numbers in the counting stats, but became back to being an elite shooter. Now, I say all of this because I would say that his position in the starting five is the most tenuous. There are arguments you could say, well, what about our top six pick, Benedict Matherin? Wouldn't he have an opportunity to start? What about our top seven pick, Jarris Walker, who they are grooming to play the three? Couldn't these guys have opportunities to push Aaron Neesmith? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <would> you. Say- <laughs> good. Good answer. <laughs> I don't necessarily mean that to dump on either of those lottery picks. Of course, they've kept because they believe in their potential. But, I mean, if you're constructing a lineup around Tyree Halliburton and Pascal Siakam and their offensive skills, again, if, if Halliburton was on the floor, like it could have been like me and Josh and two guys off the street. Like they would have had a 116 at least offensive rating, and they routinely pushed 120 or higher with him out there. Like th- what they need to have around him is shooting, defense, and quick decision makers. And guess what? Neesmith – Shot it really well last year, like you said. And yes, he fouls a lot, but that's he has tough assignments, and he's their only really wing size guy besides Siakam. He's g- a good defender. Same with Andrew Nemhard, who's a little worse than Neesmith as the shooter, but probably a little better as a defender. And Siakam and Turner, like you said, are locks to start. So that lineup, that's what I guessed would be the starting five right after they traded Buddy Heald in February. And it took them a few games to get there, but they never went away from it once they got to it because it was so obviously the best one, even in the postseason. So yes, Matherin. You know, they, they picked him high. He's good enough to be in a rotation, but he needs the ball and is not as good of a defender right now as Neesmith Smith and Nemhard. You know, if he needs touches, he should not play as often with the combo of Halliburton and Siakam. And Jarris might not play at all to start the season this year. I'm sure we'll get to him later. He's got some growing to do. So uh, Matherin probably has the best case of any non-starter just because of his long-term potential, but they're not in a mode of looking at potential anymore. They're trying to win games right now. And their starting five last year proved to be very good. I think they'll roll with that again starting the season. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And then that brings us to your yeah, projected bench grouping. And it sort of highlights all that stuff. We've got TJ McConnell there who was out of the rotation early last season and then forced his way back in with some yeah, some of the best play of his career, honestly. Benedict Matherin, Ben Shepard, who was also didn't play much at all, then had some real strong moments in the postseason. He also played in summer league and didn't look very good in that setting. So we'll see where that goes. Obi Toppin and Isaiah Jackson. I can see Shepard maybe falling out at some point and maybe that does get replaced by a Jarris Walker or Johnny Furphy in that bench group. But when you look at that group and you look at 
you know, Obi Toppin, who had some okay moments last season, but he really is just a reserve and, and Mathurin. And there's just too many guys to have a look at some of these players, whether it's TJ or Mathurin or Toppin. Unless there are major injuries, there's too many players in there that, that are going to, you know, for them to see you know, sizable roles. It's not like we're sitting there, like I'll just reference like a Jordan Clarkson on the Jazz, where he's still going to get 30 minutes necessarily coming off the bench. I don't really see that for any of these guys. Yeah, it'll be tough for any of them to have major roles, right? Last year, they, I think the most bench minutes guy was Smatherin at like 24, 25 ish. Yeah. I'd have to double check that, right? And I'd imagine that will still be the same, but it's different now because they had like when Matherin got hurt in, in early March, I mean, from the rest of the season on, TJ McConnell was like, what, a top five isolation scorer? And that sounds comical to say out loud, but like, <laughs> did you watch the Pacers? It happened. It, it like, was it crazy. Was real. Yeah. Yeah. And he, so he took on a scoring and passing role remarkably well. And Obi Toppin was one of three guys, the other two being Chet and Wemby, to hit 100 threes and have 100 dunks last year. Like he really fits offensively with this Pacers team. And, and so, you know, he, because he can shoot now, he kind of fits with anybody. So this bench really works, but you can't play it a lot. And so that's kind of a, a tricky balance of minutes that they have. Yeah, Matherin was the only guy over 21 minutes of these bench guys that we're talking about who's still back from last season. So I'd imagine they're all going to be about the, the same range as last season, give or take a few for Isaiah Jackson, just because of Jalen Smith's departure. Um, and that makes a lot of sense and, and all their lineups click and work. And they really only trusted eight guys last year, but now they kind of have to do more with Matherin. So I'll be curious I, I, what, like what you said about Ben Shepard, but they love him. He can guard and he takes threes when he's open and doesn't mess up very much. But I agree that that would be the spot that if someone like Walker or Furby snuck in, it would be that spot. Because I'm a professional, I'm going to really transition that that little part into this next part. So we're going to do a key injury update. And, and I know that he wasn't necessarily always injured at the end of last season, but he was because Tyrus Halliburton missed so much time throughout the year. We saw um, yeah, we, we saw Halliburton miss that chunk of games, came back, yeah, unbelievably early from a hamstring injury. Some would say too early. In fact, I would, and I said it at the time and did not look himself for a long period of time and then got injured again in the playoffs. So, you know, obviously he's playing for Team USA uh, at the moment. The hamstring is totally okay. We don't have to relitigate why he came back. We all know why he came back early. But I want to just use this to talk a little bit about Halliburton and talk a little bit about hey, if he was to be hurt again. First question, do you think that they would push Andrew Nembhard to point guard and start Matherin, or would they put TJ McConnell in and keep him next to Nampard. Like, how do you see that sort of priority? Because it's not debatable to me that McConnell was a much better player than Matherin last season. How do you think that they will run that sort of um, alignment if Halliburton had to go down again this season? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, you nailed all the parts of Halliburton's season that don't need to be rehashed. I'll try to answer this in 65 words at a minimum. How about that? That go can ahead, be our, my, my <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think they'd move Nemhard to the one and then start another guard. But I don't could be shepherd, it's actually. hard to think part of Matherin's, you know, decision with the second units, he can have the ball as much mm. as he needs to. Maybe he could, you know, Nemhard can't have the use that Halliburton does. No one really can in the league. But maybe the, I, I do wonder and I wonder this because they did this in the conference finals, if they would start Ben Shepard yeah. uh, because he's low usage and then Matherin can still have it as much as he needs mm. to with those bench groups. But I think they didn't have Matherin in the conference finals either. Um, so it's not really fair to just point at that and say, yeah, that's what they did before. So I would guess that your prediction is correct. It would be Nemhard at the one and Mather at the two in those cases. But we've seen that Rick Carlisle really likes to keep the structure of his bench together in terms of how it plays. And so if their identity is really based on McConnell and Mather and just smashing those units, it would not surprise me if that's what they did. The other thing about Halliburton is he was awesome to start the season. Everyone was talking about how good he is, top three offensive player in basketball. Yeah, is he in the discussion for MVP? Pinged his hammy, it looked really bad, came back to it, all that, and then he struggled. But, Tony, I want to sort of get like a, an estimate, because no one can know this answer, but I want to get a, an estimated guess from you of like the decline in Halliburton's play post-injury, the decline in some of his numbers, shooting numbers, usage numbers, how much do you attribute to lack of confidence in the leg or the addition of Pascal Siakam? Because we didn't really get to see Ooh. Halliburton running at absolute full tilt, destroying teams when Siakam was there. Once he came yeah, back, I actually, we, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't know. Like I, I, I don't know, but I want to see your educated guess as to which, which one of those is the larger impact. Can I blow your mind with a third option as mm -hmm. well? Go for it. The, the lack of Buddy Heald on the team. 
yep. uh, I think played a role here. So you're, I think the biggest thing that changed from his pre-injury to post-injury reality, because when he was out is when they traded for Siakam. So it's kind of hard to marry up all these exactly. conflicting factors, like you said, right? So if you look after the injury, even when he was like kind of like not sucking, but like for his standards, not yeah. playing well. He was making his two pointers at a at like above 60% rate. He was passing more often to good shots, like by the numbers, but he didn't have Buddy Hill on his team anymore. And he wasn't making threes. So his assist numbers were down because his teammates weren't shooting as well because they lost a good shooter. And he himself was not making threes. Like Pages were like bottom five and three point percentage for a little over a month. So from the return of his injury to this terrible stretch he had in mid March from three, I think he was like almost, yeah, he was at 28.3% on six yeah. and a half per game. Yeah. Everything else was like for the rest of the season, he was 39% from deep, right? So, yeah, that's a terrible month and a half. I'm not going to excuse that. It happened. But I think the fact that in that stretch, he was hurt. So he couldn't get that like off his left foot fading from the right wing three that he just made like every time it felt like for the first two months of the season. Without Buddy Heal, he became the off ball guy for them, right? So when Siakam would have it, he would be running a lot of that healed stuff. He talked about that a lot. Big adjustment. He's doing some of that with Team USA right now. All of that, I think, played into his, his, for lack of a better term, struggles, again, compared to his expectation. He was still pretty good by the numbers. But I think that now that he's done it for a year, uh, they figured that out, right? He shot it better in the postseason. His numbers rebounded at the end of March, uh, and Siakam will have a training camp with the team. I, I It's possible that he's not you know, the, the guy he's been for his whole career from three, but I'd expect him to get pretty close to it again just because all those factors are kind of, you know, the, to bring it back, rear in the rearview mirror. Uh <laughs> for indiana and they can he can really kind of get going from deep again it is going to be something to, to to watch really and we need to sort of see full health full training camp siakam full health full training camp halliburton yep. together and see how the usage distributes because it, it might be lower than what halliburton was doing before we don't know we're going to talk a little bit more about siakam later on but i'm as for as good of a player he is i'm not sure how much there is to talk about but we'll, we'll get to that in a uh, in a little bit but first Today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. It's busy. Life is busy. Work is busy. Kids are busy. Whatever it is, it's busy. But sometimes we need to make sure we take that time out to take care of ourselves. Self-care is important. You might say, you might live by an idea of never skip leg day, but maybe you should be not skipping self-care day as well. Whatever that is. Is it going to a spa? Is it getting your little toes done at a, at a pedicure? Is it going and sinking beers with your mates? I don't know. Whatever it is, self-care can be and should be a non-negotiable. Therapy can also be one of those things that is part of self-care. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. So you fill out a brief questionnaire, you get matched with a therapist who fits your needs. And if that therapist doesn't click with you, and that happens, who cares? That's what happens. You just... Get a new one, no charge, easy, start again because you've got to find that right match. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. All right, so we are here again now, back to talk Indiana Pacers, Tony. That's what we do here on this show. Um, we want to talk about a player to watch. Again, I ask all of the people coming on to, to give me their answer to this. And you went with the man who just signed that big-ish contract, contract big, big enough contract extension, Andrew Nempard. Now, I want to just chuck something ahead because it is really important. We know that there is amplified um, eyes, views, thoughts, memories on the playoffs, right? Andrew Nempard had some really big games. You heard the term. I'm sure you heard it. Well, this is the next Jalen Brunson. Halliburton was out, he stepped up, he went crazy. Look what happens when they gave him a starting nod. And my pushback, my pushback is never to like to shit on these guys, even though he is from Canada and everyone from Canada sucks. They all know that, that's okay. Andrew Nempard started big chunks of the season. He started in place of Tyrese Halliburton many times over the first two years of his career, even last season. And he didn't do anything remotely resembling what he did in the playoffs. In those games, he was outplayed consistently, I thought, by TJ McConnell, who was coming off the bench. So this, I'd, I again, not saying that Nempard can't develop into this you know, elite level, high level, high usage player. I think it's impossible, but I'm not well, close to impossible. I don't think he can do it, but it's not like, wow, he finally got a chance and look what happened because he started many games during the season and he was not that player, was he? 
No, he was not. Um, he is still a goodly ball. Like his his peaks oh, are he, insane, right? He, yes, everybody, unbelievable. Everybody remembers the Lakers buzzer beater that he followed mm-hmm. up by out dueling Steph in Golden State. Like what? What just happened? And then to close the season before the last one, the last month of the season, when Halburn was out. He was good that stretch, or at least statistically good that stretch when he had kind of an extended run of point guard. But you're right that it hasn't been all the time, and McConnell has been very good in a similar role. My reason for breakout is one that I've just been high on him. Last year before the season, I predicted he'd be the team's X factor. That wasn't accurate until the playoffs, but uh, I've just kind of always had this feeling about what he could be. Mine is about, like, statistically, he is very good without Hal Burton, even though it's not to the level we saw in the conference finals, obviously. Like, his assist per 100 possessions more than doubles without Hal Burton. His scoring per 100 possessions goes up by, like, six or seven. He clearly can do more than he's asked to do when yes. he's starting at the two. But what I think is is the logical player comps, not Brunson. Although, very, if you look at Brunson's contract history, not his play history, his contract history, we're getting very eerily similar <laughs> uh, oh, wow. on those timelines. It's very funny. Um, what What I think about is more like, can he be someone who plays like, not at this level, obviously, plays like Drew Holiday or a Derek White type of player? Or he said someone else he studies is Kyle Lowry, right? That kind of player, I think, is more what he could be. He's only been in the league for two years and has already had so many, like, high moments where you're like, whoa, you know? And so I, I think you are right to say that, yes, maybe what he did in those two games is, like, a little, and by a little, maybe a lot too rosy on what his peak is. But he clearly has something like no one could stay in front of him for those games. No yeah, one yeah. could. Even the guys I just said, Drew Holiday and Derek White, he just got to the room whenever he wanted. So there's something in there. He's a pretty good shooter. He's a good defender. He's just pesky and good. Everyone who's been on his team or coaches is like, yeah, this kid's awesome. So maybe he'll never be totally actualized in the role that everybody wants to see playing next to Halliburton. But he's he is just very, very good and solid. And every year they run into some hurdle where the problem is like, oh, we need Andrew Nemhard to solve it. And he does. So uh, I don't know what that translates to statistically or how much better he'll be, but there's a reason they were tripping all over themselves to give him the match extension the second they could because he's awesome and they want to keep him around. Yeah, look, I, I say this not that I don't think that he can be a really solid player. He he can. It's more just to provide um, your context around this because I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, Tony, but you know how many games he started last season? 20-something low? No, 47. Like he, oh, oh I, I I was thinking just that point guard. Okay, I don't know yeah. why I just so he started he started forty seven yes. games. And if you look at the, if the, you guys are watching on the video on the screen, like his usage was under sixteen percent in twenty five minutes. So he shot really well, but that's really really low. Like that is a incredibly low usage number. So while I I do think that he is going to establish as the permanent starter this season, because again it was in flux, it was Mather, and then it was healed last season, and they went to an Empire. I think he's establishing that role. I do think that the consistency is part of it. And look, like you said the peaks have been crazy. He just has never been able to sustain those peaks for any period of time that's longer than like three or four games in a row, really. So that's what we want to watch. I'm excited to see where it goes. I have some skepticism about how he can maintain at a, a higher ramped up level, but you, know, you can't deny the things that happened. It's more about there are other things that people do sort of forget about it at times. And that's where sometimes we need to uh, yeah, just give it a level of, hey, let's just wait and see what happens. I get a comment on YouTube like once a week about them trading Halliburton to give Nemhard a bigger role. Like that's how pilled Pacers fans are on this guy. He he just has those kind of he just has that kind of you know, that oomph and gravity to him that fans really love. There's there's always there's always that one player on nearly every team where someone's like they just need to give him the keys and it'd be like <laughs> so, like something like completely like crazy. Not saying that it's a bit like yeah let's trade away our yeah top five MVP candidate to see if what Andrew, <laughs> what Andrew Nemhard can do like. Guys, I, th- I think we're I think we're okay with that. Let's um, let's talk about who Tony you have as a make or break player, and this again ties into that guard position. We've mentioned this man a couple of times already because he was given a large role out of the gate as a rookie. Um, he had an opportunity last season, Benedict Matherin, to be the starter, and it did not work. It did not last. His usage fell down considerably. Playing in that starting group, he still maintains a real lack of offensive vision at times, a narrow feel about rearview mirrors. This guy doesn't even have side mirrors. He just looks one way and the shooting numbers fluctuate. Even his ability which to get to the line, which is so strong as a rookie, did drop off. So it's year, it sounds crazy. It's year three. He's a top six pick. He, yeah, I think he was a first team or rookie guy. 
but I, you're right. Like there have been so many people who have now overtaken him in in the rotation. Like even like you know twenty sixth pick Ben Shepherd, there are plenty of guys who have overtaken him. So look, what what does he need to do, and do you think he's capable of doing it? Yeah, it's weird to answer him for this question because first, like some other teams, the answer for a make or break guy would be someone who's like, can they be good or not good? Like Ben Matherin yeah. is a good player. Yeah, he is. The question about for make or break for him and with me is and this is even really like stuff he's talked about in his ex interview is about his fit with the Pacers, right? And how he helps this specific team win because a lot of what he is tasked to do and asked about, he's talked about how he wants Rick Carlisle to coach him hard is quick decisions, right? Catch, drive, yeah. pass, catch, shoot, catch, you know, and he is a catch, size it up, you know, make a move and then set something else up. And so there are games. He had a game against Detroit that everybody will point to where it's like he made – a bunch of different ki- types of passes, was getting to the rim and creating offense, scored a bunch of points. Like, we're like, oh my gosh, this guy, if this could all click every night, it would be awesome. And then there are other games where it doesn't work at all. And so the problem is with a lot of guys on the Pacers who fit this bill of like developing ball handlers is they have Tyrese Halliburton who has the ball all the time. And so if you want to pair that guy with Halliburton, they have to be good at either keeping the ball moving or shooting or defense, I guess. Um, and he improved as a shooter last year, certainly. I think he hit 38 percent from three almost 37.4 right better there his on-ball defense is good his team defense is, is still developing so in some ways he, he improved where he needed to his assist rate went up his steal rate went up his block rate went up he, fewer turnovers that's great um at the same time it just still hasn't all clicked and fit with what they're doing which is why they didn't keep starting him after that open to the season and so the make or break for him is can he do the stuff that would make him a great fit with the Pacers because again there's no denying he's a good player and would would help a lot of teams with his scoring and ability to get the foul line fourth and rookie of the year two years ago, he got sixth man of the year, but like mm. high level votes. The question is, can that gel with how the Pacers play? And he had a really big moment of, you know, this was the most dramatic in, in a good way that he's been about it during his exit interview. He's like, my whole life, I've been the best player on the team. You know, I've been asked to score, 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 be that kind of guy. And in the NBA, that just hits you at some point. It's like, dang, that's I'm not, you know, I'm mm. just not anymore. And you have to adapt your game. And so I think he knows it. I think he knows the skills that are acquired of him. And you, you're right that when he drives sometimes it's tunnel vision to, to get to the rim and either draw a foul, which he's good at, or score. But if he can just develop some extra passing style, uh, be a really good catch and shoot guy when he knows the ball's coming his way, that would go such a long way in him being A, a good fit with this team, and B, being an important piece because he's very good and under contract for a while. I'm glad that he said all of those things because they're one of the things that I, I talk about quite a bit on this show is that like people will look of, honestly through the draft process and they'll see this guy who comes in with 18 usage. Oh, he can be a 3 or D guy. The 3 and D guys in the NBA are the players who are 27 usage and the best players on their team and they have to scale things back. It's not the players who are role player 3 or D players in college usually who do that same thing. And right. then my next question is always like when, when you don't have the ball and you're taking every shot, do you do anything? And... If you can't, then you're useless to majority of teams. And that's what he does need to do. Now, again, I criticize his passing. He did increase his assist rate. But a lot of other things did, like his rim finishing numbers, dropped way off. And everything else was sort of incremental improvements. The three-point shooting is a big improvement, but his impact stats went down. His yeah, his steal rate went from 1% to 1.1. His blocks from 0.5 to 0.7. They're small. They're important. But it was just like overall, he just didn't you know, expand that out. But... That self-awareness, and a lot of players don't have that, that self-awareness to know, hey, look, man, I, I, I can't be this guy. I need to try and change. Now, whether he can do it or not remains to be seen. But that, that is, again, I, I do agree with you. That it is make or break. Other players pass him. Other players who are less talented or less skilled are ahead of him now, and he needs to change what he does, or he ends up on a team that's bad and finds his position in like a a uh, you know a worse Zach Levine on a bad team and just gets lots of shots and... Averages twenty a game and yeah impacts losing versus impacting winning. So it, it is intriguing to see where he goes and whether he improves from here or actually whether he gets worse and other guys continue to uh, to move forward ahead of him. A big big uh, season coming up for Benedict Matherin. Tony, to me, the major storyline for this team this season is something we referenced earlier. Was last season a fluke? Do you think that this team like they didn't? do anything really in the offseason to get better. They The thing that they're banking on is Pascal Siakam's full offseason and integration with his team. So is that enough to make this last season not a fluke and be a perennial conference finals level team? I think the other bet they're making is that they have so many 
younger or lesser experienced guys that m some of them, if not all of them, will be better, right? Yeah. Like last year, their playoff rotation, Tyrese Halliburton on his rookie scale deal, Andrew Nemhard on his rookie, second second round pick exception deal. Neesmith was on his rookie scale deal. Obi Toppin was on his rookie scale deal. Isaiah Jackson was on his rookie scale deal. Ben Shepard was on his, you get what I'm saying. That doesn't even include Matherin and Walker. So the bet on the, why they were such a natural run at back candidate beyond their finances is because it's easy for them to say, yes, we think we can be better with the exact same team. Because if, if we have an off season with everybody together, guys get better as they do in the summers. We have guys playing internationally who can get better there. That, that is the vision of how they improve as a team, and that has sometimes worked for teams. That has also sometimes not worked for teams, especially when that is paired with going from a team that did not have expectations to a team that now does have expectations. How does that change how you react to losing and winning and things like that? So I think it, it was a fine bet and choice to make to largely run it back, but they are counting on, uh, unless – you know, maybe their their best players can get better too, but I think they are counting on one or two young guys to take a step forward and be a better player this year to to be then themselves a better team that isn't like you know, they clinched the playoffs on the last day of the season, right? Like sure. a better team would would not have that happen. So I think that's a big bet for them is we have so many younger and inexperienced guys that one or two are if, if all of them do, that'd be amazing, obviously. But if one or two of them take a step forward, they'll be a better team than last year. The burning one of the burning questions for me with this team, Tony, is we've referenced his name a couple of times already, but what is the plan with Jarris Walker? Like they traded down with the Wizards last season because they didn't think the Wizards would take him. They wanted him. They got him pick seven. They traded for Roby Toppin to play the same position, and Walker just didn't play. And then this season in summer league, they were playing him more as a three. He was just taking a million three pointers. He was taking pull up threes. He was initiating offense. I like, initially to me the, the idea was him coming out of the draft was he's a four who can play small ball five with some passing ability. And now they're sort of going the opposite direction to that. But like we detailed earlier, there's not even necessarily a clear, clear path for minutes there. It's not common for a top seven pick to not play at all really in their first two seasons. And it seems like the plan is a little bit all over the place. So what is the plan? Like, where are we at with what Jarris Walker has done? Is Has it been a disappointment to the organization, do you think? Yeah, let's call Philip Rossman Reich and copy-paste his answer on Anthony Black, right? Like, <laughs> it's very similar how those teams are constructed and how those minutes loads work for those guys who went pretty close in the draft. The different – okay, so one thing I would love to know, by the way, I don't know if you have the graphics year over year, is I might have predicted Jarris Walker on the show to start last year. Like, I – when I was doing my rotation projections for the season, wondered if Walker or Toppin would start, but I thought they'd play about even minutes. That was wrong, obviously. Toppin played much more, and they had, like, Jalen Smith playing the four at times, and they didn't even have a backup four at times. Jordan War, I played 18 games for them last year. Like, all that happened, and that said some things about where they thought of where Jarris was. Rick Carlisle did not like how much he gambled defensively. His offense overall was kind of unclear. They played him more in the G League. The difference is a couple things. One, he's gotten better at those defensive gambles. You saw that a little bit in summer league. Um, two is his three ball has been gotten way better. Like he legitimately can shoot it, which was a question for him coming out of college. The reason I think he'll play more this year is I just mentioned a couple of the names, but you know, last year they had their rotation and then there was like a blockade of players who weren't in the rotation that were still ahead of Jarris Walker, like Jordan Wara, for example, but they don't have Bruce Brown anymore. They don't have Buddy Heald anymore. Doug McDermott is gone. Jordan Wara is gone. If any player gets hurt, like anyone in the rotation, you could get minutes for Jarris Walker. You know, if a four gets hurt, it's obviously an easy. You just stick him in. If a three gets hurt, an obvious and easy. You just stick him in. If a two gets hurt, move move Ben Shepard down a spot, and you can play Jarris. If a one gets hurt, move Andrew Nemhard down, you can play Jarris. If a five gets hurt, move Obi up, and you can play him. Maybe they would play Wiseman in that case. But I bring all that up to say – that, that doesn't sound awesome. <laughs> you know, the, they just picked this guy in the lottery and you'd like to be able to play him, but they have a lot of talent that they should be playing, that they're a good team. I think that that is still progress. He will play a lot more this year because of that, where he is easily the 11th man who has lots of opportunities to actually play, but you have to prove it and actually fit in and be better, of course, to earn those minutes. They're a team trying to win games now. But I think that is the outlook that they should be pitching, is that there will be more chances for him when injuries happen and maybe he can earn a, a permanent role by playing well in those minutes so yeah i agree that it's kind of fuzzy right now and kind of weird that how little he has played given what their reality was entering last season but i think it is trending towards him playing more and potentially even more the year after when they have to make some financial decisions two things i checked 
what you predicted last season and you predicted Obi Toppin to start. So congratulations. Okay. You didn't go with Jarris Walker. You had him in the reserve role. But also looking at some of Toppin, uh, Toppin Walker's numbers, like really good steal rate, really good block rate, but finish at 42% in the rim in his 330 minutes in the NBA. That's, yeah. that's really bad. Shot well from three, but like that needs to improve. Interestingly, his you know, EPM estimated plus minus was higher than Benedict Matherin's. Not that it was good. It was negative 2.7. But... You know, there is there was there were some flashes there, it, but you're right. It's about this For team sure. is winning, right? They want to win, and there's no just easy spot to fit him in because well, I take Aaron Nesmith off, yeah, but he does this, or Obi Toppin comes off, yeah, but he does this, and there's just it's it is just hard, and sometimes, and I also think that like I I I, come, I said it, I said look, hey, he's a top seven pick, and he hasn't may not may not play a big role for two years. That's really weird, but there's also something to be said that that's just a mentality that we've sort of drilled into our head. And maybe it's okay if these guys don't play big roles and we wait for the right opportunity and they play at the time when it makes the most sense as a lot of other sports do versus like, hey, he's got to play and he's got to be in that spot. I think it's actually, while it's frustrating and it's weird, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing because he could come in year three. He said other guys move on, get injured. He steps in, he's got like, holy shit, this guy's already at this level because we've taken the time and pushed him into the spot where he needs to be versus like we just just give him minutes because we invested in it. Like so, I, yeah, I'm intrigued. I'm, I think there's still a lot there. It is a different process for a pick that high, but I'm not like not writing that off as like a, a bust or anything like that, Tony. Now, I did ask you, what is your big bold prediction for this season? I want you to really expand on this one. We'd have to really expand, just expand a little bit. You said there'll be a puzzling trade. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think this is the next calendar year thing to look out for for the Pacers because they are currently, like I mentioned earlier, extremely close to the luxury tax. Hmm. Next year, they're going to be about $30 million away before paying Miles Turner or TJ McConnell uh, or yeah. Isaiah Jackson. And then the following year, Benedict Mathery, guess what? You're up for money. So they can't really afford the entire current structure of their team. And they are also very clearly probably in need of one more upgrade sizable like very, very good player. And so I don't know if they, that player becomes available this season, but because of their financial reality, I bet in the next 12 to 18 months, they make a trade either involving someone who's good uh, or a young player that has some clear upside that makes everybody go, why did they do that? And it's not that it will be like a bad value trade. It will just be puzzling in that it was very financially motivated and it's something they needed to do to make their team make sense long-term because they have a long runway with this Halliburton, Nemhard, Neesmith, Siakam grouping now. That's three plus years of all those guys. But to make it all hum and make it actually a team that can contend, they might have to do a trade that makes everybody go, why did they do that? Well, that's why, because the money is going to be a factor. And we've seen it this summer with the small cap growth and the aprons. Teams operate differently. They do. Let's look at the team record. This team won 47 games last season. Obviously, they made the Eastern Conference Finals, but they were a six seed. Tony, you predicted that they would be Exactly the same, win loss record. Yeah. Um, okay. Is that mainly because the Eastern Conference is better, even though we're expecting better health from Halliburton, more consistency? We're expect we've got a full season from Siakam. Like, and where do you think a forty-seven win season places them? Is it plain? Probably not. But is it like top four? Is it top six again? Yeah, I think 47 for the reasons you described. I think they'll be a little better than last year for some of those internal development reasons we talked about. You know, that their rotation is largely the same. This team knows how to play together. Continuity is great, uh, but the Knicks got Mikael Bridges and the Cavs are still really good. And the Sixers, who they finished ahead of, are better, for example, than last year. And the Bucks are better. So, like, these are teams that are just tough to beat. So maybe their record against those top teams gets a little worse. They also were like improbably bad against awful teams last year, right? They lost to Charlotte twice. They lost to the Nets. They lost to the Wizards. They lost They lost to everybody who stunk last year at least once, except for Detroit. They lost to Portland twice, right? So yeah. there's a lot of balancing of their, of their, for lack of a better term, like resume, is, to use a college term for their wins and losses. But I think that because some other teams got better, the East in general is probably a little worse, but the West is better. I think they're probably going to finish with about the same number of wins. And I think in the East, that'll land them somewhere between five, six, and seven. Uh, but they've proven that they can beat these top teams, right? They beat Boston twice last year. They beat Philly twice last year. Uh, they, they, they were good against they, – they swept OKC last year, right? They swept OKC and got swept by Portland, right? It's a very confusing hmm. team. So, you know, I, how that all balances out is going to be hard to say. But I think in general, I think most people feel this way. A lot of teams got at least a little better, if not a lot better. 
this off season. And so teams that just got a little better, yeah, they're better, but how much does that amount to in terms of wins? I think it probably comes out in the watch for the Pacers, even though their standing spot will maybe be a little better. Yeah, I can say that. I Yeah, we looked at the very start of the show of who's in, who's out, and it's like, okay, it's about the same. So being about the same <laughs> makes sense. There are obviously things that can break either way, but I think that makes sense. Now, Tony, I do want to finish this with a quiz. We head into the 24-25 season, and people who have watched this show know what I'm going to ask you. So I'm going to ask you this now. It's really simple stuff. It's the 24-25 season. Who is the first name that comes to your mind that wore number 24 or 25 for the Indiana Pacers? Oh, my gosh. Jalen Smith. Jalen Smith was the most recent number 25, correct? Yes. 24? Uh, I don't know if I can do – did Ben Moore wear 24 or was he 20? I think uh, he was 20. Well, he, he didn't wear 24, so he's not there. But it, it was someone who was on the team last season. Oh, no, that's not good. <laughs> that's really not good. Last season, and I can't remember. Are they gone? They're not gone. Oh, they're gone, yeah. They're gone. They, I are, don't, they, are, they wanted to go. Oh, Buddy Heald wore 24. Buddy Heald. Oh, he switched to seven. That's why it threw me off so much. Buddy Heald did wear 24. I'm looking at the list of names. I'm, I, I'm, you will remember this when I tell you, but do you remember, when, remember Paul George used to be 24? <laughs> yes, I do. Wow. I thought there had to be someone more recent than him. Uh, there was. Uh, Alizé Johnson was between Paul George oh. and, uh, uh, and, and Buddy Heald. Dang. Hill. And That's then a good one. Rakeem Christmas was a number 25 legend, as was uh, Al Jefferson. Yep. What else? Any other funny names? I think Quinn Buckner was 25 back in the 80s. And there you go. What a poor these are. Wow. Yeah, so there's a, there's a list of names there for the 24-25 season. Jalen Smith, Buddy Heal, the Pacers, they're removing their rearview mirrors. They've gotten rid of their 24 and 25. They're going to bring new 24s and 25s in for the 24 and 25 season. I've said that word too many times. Tony East, tell us what's going on over at Locked on Pacers. Yeah, lots of stuff like this. Looking at next year, Dustin Dopierak and I are going to talk on tomorrow's show for you guys listening about the biggest storylines for this Pacers team, diving in deeper on a lot of these young guys, how this team clicks, can Halliburton and see how can be better, all sorts of good stuff. You'll want to check it out. Go and check it out, Tony. Thank you again for coming on and uh, chatting about the Pacers with me. Happy to do it, Josh. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. Josh is the best, has to keep up with every player in the league and does a very good job of it. Tomorrow here on Lockdown Pacers, Dustin Dopierak from the Indy Star is going to join us to talk about the biggest storylines for this upcoming Pacers season, including looking back at what we talked about last year for that same topic. How well or poorly did we do in that discussion? Hope you guys will enjoy that and come back. Tell then everybody, have a wonderful day.